Welcome, welcome uh, to the official opening of our Title IX at 40 conference. Thank you all so much for being here, and it's going to be a great day, and it's a beautiful day outside, and we're looking forward to spending uh, the next day and a half with all of you. My name is Kathy Babiak, and I'm the co-director of the Sharp Center for Women and Girls and one of the members of the organizing team for this conference. And on behalf of the Sharp team, we welcome you and thank you for your participation. For those of you who don't know, the Sharp Center was created through a partnership with the Women's Sports Foundation, the Institute for Research in Women and Gender, and the School of Kinesiology here at the University of Michigan. And our, our objective, or our purpose, is to enhance the lives of women and girls through sport, physical activity, play, and movement to, Im and to improve our understanding to the barriers to and opportunities for full participation. We're a research incubator and are creating knowledge to improve the scope and quality of girls' and women's experiences with sport and physical activity across the lifespan. Um, and we, we're conducting interdisciplinary social and biomedical research in this regard. Last night, we heard Layla Ali talk about the importance of involvement in sport for women and girls, and that's why we're all here today, to support these efforts for equity and access in sport for women. And we are so excited to have some of the biggest thinkers, leaders, advocates, and supporters of Title IX with us for the next two days. Thank you to all of the speakers who have agreed to be part of this conference, and without you, this could not be a reality. Most of you know, many of you know, Title IX is a legal, social, educational, economic, and public health issue. It's an issue of great relevance that crosses social and disciplinary boundaries. You'll see in your program uh, that this conference is organized around four key themes uh, around Title IX and the broad impact that it's had. The four themes are the link between Title IX and physical health and fitness for women and girls, and those sessions uh, we'll hear uh, speakers and experts uh, talking about this morning. Later on this afternoon, the theme is Title IX and education and employment for women and girls. Tomorrow morning, we'll hear about the theme of Title IX and the impact on American culture and the psychological, social, and economic influences. And then finally, um, the final theme, the link between Title IX and boys' and men's experiences in sport. So we're not just reflecting back on the last 40 years of Title IX through this, con uh, through this conference and through your participation. We want to identify areas of need in terms of research, practice, and advocacy. And our aim is to create a white paper with a call to action for what still needs to be done and explored to fulfill the objectives of this landmark legislation. So as you're attending the sessions, please think about these important questions and make suggestions to the moderators, panelists, or um, any of the, of the SHARP uh, leadership. We'll have note takers in each room, and so make sure that, um, that they can hear you so we can capture uh, all of the conversation throughout the next two days. And in order to support these research directions that will come out of this conference, I'm pleased to announce that in our next funding cycle, the Sharp Center will provide one grant to a researcher from any academic institution who pursues a theme related to the priorities gathered from our call to action initiative here. So, that's exciting. So this conference could not have been made possible without the generous support of the Rackham School of Graduate Studies at the University of Michigan. And it's now my pleasure to introduce Dean Janet Weiss of the Rackham School of Graduate Studies to say a, um, a bit about this funding and the importance of these meetings that Rackham is supporting. So thank you all, and uh, Dr. Weiss. Thank you very much. Uh, I am really delighted to be here to be part of the welcome. Welcome to our out-of-town guests for being at the University of Michigan and uh, this wonderful conference on Title IX at 40. So this gathering uh, is part of a series sponsored by the Rackham Graduate School, which we call the Michigan Meetings. 
And the Rackham Graduate School has a long history of experimentation with ways to promote, nourish, and showcase interdisciplinary scholarship and conversation. And both the Graduate School and the University have a long tradition of scholarship linked to improving policy and practice. As a public research university, we see this as a critical part of our mission uh, to see that the work of our faculty and our students have an impact on people's lives. So our work here today in this conference and in all of the Michigan meetings is squarely in these traditions. Each one of the meetings is designed to bring together faculty and graduate students at Michigan together with colleagues and experts from around the nation and around the world to experience intellectually exciting events of both scholarly and practical importance. So Title IX has obviously changed the lives of women and girls in a host of ways, both anticipated and many unanticipated, uh, since 1972. And so it's fitting that we should take a look at this 40-year mark uh, and remind ourselves about the goals and issues that are raised. Uh, as Kathy just explained, the meeting's been organized by SHARP, and it's very exciting to see such a wonderfully diverse set of speakers and guests, of faculty and students and athletes and athletic administrators and government officials and lawyers and university administrators and advocates and lots of people who just believe that they have a stake in how Title IX is working for all of us. It's especially, as a graduate dean, it's especially exciting to see graduate students as a part of this conversation because they represent the next generation of scholars and activists and policymakers who will play leadership roles on these issues in the coming generation. But for all of you, um, we're delighted that you're here. Uh, I strongly believe that one of the values of these meetings is not to summarize a conversation, but to launch a conversation. And um, there, there will be uh, really interesting results of this particular conference. Uh, I'm really delighted now to introduce uh, Catherine Olson, the Chief Executive Officer of the Women's Sports Foundation, who is the university's key partner uh, in the Sharp Center. Uh, Ms. Olson was named Chief Executive Officer of the Women's Sports Foundation in April of 2010, uh, having served as a trustee since 2005. Before she joined the Women's Sports Foundation, she had a uh, long and varied career in the business world. Uh, but as she was telling me last night, she left the business world to join the Women's Sports Foundation out of a real passion and commitment for young girls and, uh, and their futures. Uh, Ms. Olson was named one of the most influential women in business uh, in 2009 and 2010 by San Francisco Business Times. And not surprisingly, of course, she's an athlete herself. Uh, both in her, um, in her younger days and, uh, and still today. So please join me in welcoming Katherine Olson. <laughs> thank you, Janet, and uh, thank you also for selecting Title IX as the topic for this meeting, and thank you to the University of Michigan for hosting this inaugural conference for SHARP. It's uh, truly gonna be a wonderful couple of days. And the Women's Sports Foundation has long been a vocal advocate and expert on Title IX, so to be working with a partner who shares these values is truly a pleasure. Um, it is also with great pleasure that I will be introducing our next speaker, Amy Berman. And do you know why? Because Amy Berman rocks. <laughs> It's on Twitter, <laughs> for real. Uh, of course, I have seen tweets that say Jenny Finch rocks, Sarah Hughes, Layla Ali rocks. Sure, the athletes rock. But an enforcement director at the US Department of Education, enforcement directors do not usually rock. So we know we have a special one here with us today. <laughs> 
Uh, Amy Berman is in the Office of Civil Rights, where she works to ensure equal access, where she works to ensure educational excellence for our daughters and for our sons. She, um, uh, I say, what could be more important than the vigorous enforcement of our civil rights, which include Title IX? Prior to the OCR, Amy was at the U.S. Department of Justice Civil Rights Division Educu Educational Opportunities Section for nine years. She also edited the Harvard Civil Rights Civil Liberties Law Review while she got her JD cum laude. So you know she really knows her stuff. Amy has a big heart as well as she spends her free time helping the most at-risk girls and women through her work on various boards, including the Youth Empowerment Mission. Amy is also the mother of two young athletes, age five and eight, so she knows firsthand the benefit of sport and has a very personal interest in this conference. So please join me in welcoming Amy Berman. Thank you. It's such an honor and a privilege to be here. Um, you have two days filled with dialogue with some amazing experts in the field who um, I've had the privilege and honor to work with and know over the years. Um, I want to thank the Sharp Center for having me for the University of Michigan um, and obviously for the Women's Sports Foundation. This is an amazing partnership. And um, I know that there will be wonderful things to come. And it was exciting even um, looking at some of the amazing things that you guys have already done. You have a great report up there already. So it's very exciting to be here. Um, I wanted to just start with a little something personal. Um, everybody has a tie to the University of Michigan, every person I meet. Um, but I want you to know how jealous my entire husband's family is that I am here. Um, I am the only one who does not hold a degree from the University of Michigan. My mother-in-law and father-in-law do and met here. Uh, my husband does. And my sister-in-law and brother-in-law um, <laughs> do. Um, but not only do my sister-in-law and brother-in-law um, hold degrees from here, they met here at, in the in the undergrad. Um, they were both varsity gymnastics athletes in the mid-90s. And um, while they both were amazing athletes, it's my sister-in-law Deb's team who really shined when she was on it. So the last two years that she was on the team, they ranked fourth and second in the country, which is you know an amazing feat. Yes. Um, and they both went on to medical school and are both on the faculty here, and they both still do a lot of work with athletes. And so it's a real privilege just knowing how involved they are. My brother-in-law, Rich, is a psychiatrist, and he works a lot with athletes here on dealing with, you know, the sport, the life, the work balance. And my sister-in-law is an obstetrician, and she, um, she does a lot with uh, women's health issues. And so it's a privilege to be here, but I also have a request. I, I know this isn't exactly a graduation speech, but I was kind of hoping if it went well, we could talk about some type of honorary degree. <laughs> Something that when I go home, <laughs> I can have some ties. I, I just put that out there for thought. Just put that out there for thought. Okay. Um, I mean, it's aunts and cousins. It's the whole family over there. It's like, but I know all the fight songs. I can do it all. Um, and uh, if I had a PowerPoint, I was supposed to show you pictures of my children marching with the marching band, but, 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 but I'm not doing that today. OK. <laughs> um, so, so getting into Title IX, um, you know, my sister-in-law, Deb's life, probably would have looked very, very different, but for Title IX. And not just for the sports piece of it, but for the medical school part of it. And I knew that when we think about Title IX, um, you know, what first comes to mind is sports. And that's what a lot of this conference is about. But I also wanted to just take the opportunity during my, my talk with you all to talk about the other things that Title IX, talks, that Title IX touches on that are incredibly important 
important to girls and women throughout the country. Um, and when we look back on the last 40 years, there's a lot to celebrate. There's a lot of amazing accomplishments that have come with the passage of Title IX. But there's still a lot of work for all of us to do. So it's really exciting to see you all here today to be talking about what to do going forward. Um, before Title IX, an applicant was, could very easily be denied admission to a law school or a medical school. And um, Patsy Mink, who's the author of Title IX, um, is a great role model of this. She applied to approximately 20 medical schools and got into none of them because they either did not accept women at all or had such small quotas for how many women could come that she didn't get in. Um, she went on to law school, though, which is, you know, not a bad thing to go do, and, um, and served 12 terms in the House of Representatives where, you know, one of, where she accomplished many, many amazing things. Um, you know, she was the first woman of color in the House of Representatives also, and worked on a lot of legislation, but Title IX was really a crown jewel in what she accomplished. And I think when you think about it and you look at places like the University of Michigan, you really see the accomplishments that Title IX has made. Places like this where just as many women are getting JDs and MDs now, which wasn't happening back in the 1970s when Title IX was enacted. Um, I want to talk a little bit or a lot about, I guess, what the Office for Civil Rights does in the context of Title IX. The Office for Civil Rights um, does work in a variety of different ways. We investigate complaints that we receive concerning sex discrimination. We launch proactive reviews. We call them compliance reviews. Um, that's where we proactively target universities and schools to go in and look at compliance efforts that are being made. We do technical assistance to schools, to parents, to advocacy groups to make them aware of their rights and also to make them aware of what they need to do to comply. It's very exciting to have a Title IX coordinator who comes from the Office for Civil Rights, <laughs> who, uh, who, you know, who is well versed in a lot of what I'm about to talk about today. Um, and we've been really lucky. We have a president, a vice president, a secretary of education, and an assistant secretary for the Office of Civil Rights who have all worked with vigor during this administration to encourage proactive efforts under Title IX, to encourage schools and colleges to proactively address the issues that are facing women, including athletic opportunities, sexual harassment, gender-based harassment, and sexual violence that we are seeing growing on campuses today. But enforcing Title IX isn't just a federal obligation. It's something that we really believe needs to be addressed at a local level. And again, are so excited when we see people that share these values that are within the university systems. Um, it's, it's places like the University of Mich Michigan, the Sharp Foundation, um, the Women's Sports Foundation, many, many of you amazing advocates in the room, and the communities that you all serve, that the real work is done to make sure that girls are ensured equal educational opportunities. So I'm going to start with just a little bit of history with regard to Title IX in athletics, because I think that that's where most people start when they think of Title IX. Um, in 1971, when Patsy Mink was arguing for Title IX, there were eight times as many men as women playing intercollegiate sports. And at the secondary level, the problem was even greater. There were roughly 12 times as many men as women playing high school sports. Um, with the passage of Title IX, we saw dramatic increases. Women's participation in NCAA sports has increased sixfold since Title IX has been enacted, and at the high school level, it's increased tenfold. So 
And we know, and you guys will all talk about it over the next couple of days and, and heard about it last night, about the amazing benefits, even outside of the sports context, that having women and girls participate in sports leads to. We know that it leads to increased self-esteem. We know that it leads to lower teen pregnancy rates. We know that it leads to lower dropout rates. And we know that it leads to better academic achievement. And we're also seeing studies that are showing that the results are well beyond their high school and college careers. Um, you know, we're seeing studies that are showing that women who participated in sports have a 7% lower risk of being obese 20 to 25 years later. We're seeing studies that are demonstrating direct effects between sports and where women are ending up in their education and their employment. Um, one recent study said that Title IX explains a 20 percent increase in women's education and a 40 percent rise in employment for women ages 25 to 34 years old. Um, but notwithstanding these advances, we still battle stereotypes and misconceptions about what it means to have women and girls participate. And one of the most common misconceptions is that Title IX has led to a decrease in men's participation in sports. That's completely to the contrary. Men today are participating more in sports than they were 40 years ago. And I just want to give you a couple of the numbers for it. But in 1972, there were 170,000 male athletes in NCAA sports. In 2010, 2011, that number has increased by 48%. They're up to 253,000. At the high school level, going from 1971-72 school year to the 2010-11 school year, they went from approximately 3.6 million boy athletes to 4.5 million boy athletes. And so while women have made remarkable strides, the men's participation numbers continue to exceed women's in both the raw numbers and the proportion to enrollment that women and girls are in high schools and colleges. So while men are 253,000 of the NCAA athletes, women make up 191,000%. So we're still at a 43% participation rate when we know that women, there's more women in college today than there are men. And it's the same thing at the high school level. We've seen huge strides. We went from approximately 290,000 girls in the 1971-72 school year to more than 3.1 million girls in the end of the 2011 school year, which is an amazing increase. But it's still 41% of the participation rate, and boys are still making up almost 60% of the athletes. So we still have more to go. Um, and the Office for Civil Rights has been doing some extensive data collection and recently put up data that shows that 57% of the high schools that report having athletic programs, in 57% of them, there are more boys' teams than there are girls' teams on those, on those, in those high schools. Um, and the other numbers that I think are really important to, to demonstrate, though, again, is that boys' sports are not being cut at the expense of Title IX. Um, the Government Accountability Office found that of the 948 post-secondary institutions that added sports between 1992 and 2000, 72% of them did so without cutting any boys, any men's or women's teams. Um, and I want to highlight a couple of examples of where OCR worked and found that we, we can accomplish this without cutting teams. Um, recently, recently, in 2000, OCR entered into an agreement with the Tacoma Washington Public Schools. At the time, in that high school, it was 51% male and 49% female. But the participation rates were 57% male and 43, 40. 
3% female. And so while the numbers might sound might not sound huge, there were 400 more athletic opportunities for boys than there were for girls. As a result of the investigation, the <clears throat> the public school system decided to take numerous actions to make sure that they were effectively accommodating women, girls' interests in sports. They had a new athletic director with significant Title IX experience. They added several girls' teams. They developed athletic outreach activities at the middle schools. Um, they added new coaching positions. And they added an athletics improvement committee and we're happy to say that in the 2009-2010 school year through a lot of hard work and dedication the girls participation rates in Tacoma Washington equal those of of their um, enrollment rates and they did this without dropping a single sport and so at, at the 40th anniversary of Title IX it's it's places like this that we need to celebrate and we need to figure out how to make sure that all of our girls are having access the same way in Tacoma, Washington. Um, in addition to looking at participation rates, uh, we look at several other things when we're looking at athletics under Title IX. And so we're also looking at financial assistance, we're looking at something called the laundry list of factors, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Um, you know, access to medical care, access to the same level of coaches, participation opportunities, facilities. Um, we have a recent example at Ball State, Indiana, where OCR went in and did an investigation, and they were and the investigation turned up that women were receiving a lot fewer benefits there than the men's were, than the men were, um, and some of those examples were, you know, even not having the opportunity to stay overnight in hotels or when they were being put in really, really crowded hotels when they were traveling, not having the opportunity to have pre-game meals together or provided for by the university, um, not having access to as experienced medical and training staff, and you know, not having access to facilities that were equal. These girls, these women were changing in sheds. They were changing in their cars. They had no locker rooms in many situations. And OCR went in and through an agreement, oh, this has changed. And now these girls have, you know, both literally and figuratively gone from sheds to locker rooms. And they're no longer treated like second class athletes at their schools. So we have to be careful that we're looking at both areas, um, both the access, but also when you have access, what does that access look like? And just last week, OCR entered into an agreement with Butler University to resolve a Title IX compliance review, as I had discussed earlier, where we sometimes go in and proactively are looking at schools or universities. There, the women are 59.6% of the student population, but they're 36.5% of the student athletes. It's a 23% disparity between their enrollment rates and their participation rates. We entered into an agreement that by September 1st, the university has to demonstrate that it's either effectively accommodating the women's abilities and interests, or they have to provide a detailed plan explaining how in the next three years they're going to get there. We wrote right into the agreement that we're not requiring or encouraging the elimination of any university teams, and that we're seeking action from the university that doesn't involve eliminating athletic opportunities. Um, 
And just to highlight a couple of things that we've done with regard to Title IX athletics in the policy front, um, most of you or all of you are aware of the three-part test where colleges or universities or, high, or secondary level schools can demonstrate compliance with Title IX. And the, the third part of the test says that the institution is fully and effectively accommodating the interests and abilities of the underrepresented sex. So the first part, the first prong is saying they're proportional. The second prong is saying, you know, you, um, you have a history of adding teams to accommodate interest. And the third is saying we're not proportional, but, but, we're, but we're meeting the interest. Um, in April 2010, with the encouragement of a lot of you in the room and a lot of you who will be speaking on panels, the department, the Office for Civil Rights and the Department of Education, and it was announced with both the vice president and Arnie Duncan, the secretary, that prior guidance that had been put into place was rescinded. And that guidance basically said that a survey could be done, and if a survey was done and people didn't fill out the survey, then that showed that there was an interest. The April 2010 guidance shows that a lot more needs to be done to meet prong three. A survey can be part of it, but there are a lot of other ways that universities and schools need to be looking to really make sure that they're effectively and accommodating um, interests. And I have no doubt you'll hear about those other ways on panels today. But I just want to point out that there are a lot of actions that are taken at a federal level that happen because of the things that the people in the, in the room today do to make those things happen and make them effective. Um, and so, so you, I've talked a bit on the policy front, a bit on the, um, a couple of examples. Um, in recent years, OCR receives about approximately 100 athletic complaints a year. And we've really stepped up our efforts with regard to compliance reviews um, in this area. So in 2010 and 2011 fiscal years, we initiated 13 compliance reviews at both the post-secondary and at the high school level looking at Title IX athletics. Butler, which I talked about a little bit ago, being one of them. Um, I'm, I'm going to switch, though, and talk a little bit about, about Title IX issues that don't deal directly with athletics. And unfortunately, while over the past 40 years we have seen some amazing strides um, as a result of Title IX, there are some areas where th seem, things seem to be getting worse. Um, and one of those is bullying, harassment, and sexual violence. Bullying and harassment are age-old problems. Lots of people consider them rites of passage, but we're definitely seeing today in the time of the social media age that we're in and that kids today are in a soar and rise in bullying and harassment. Um, there, there was recently a study that said that 62% of all female college students have have experienced some form of harassment at some point in their career. And the same study said that 83% of girls in schools reported being harassed at some point in time. Um, Secretary Duncan often says when he speaks that students can't learn if they don't feel safe. And sadly, bullying and harassment remains a major problem that we have to deal with for girls and women in our schools. Um, in fiscal year 2010, OCR received 837 complaints about harassment, and in 2011, this number increased to 1,120, so it was a 34% increase in just one year of the complaints we were seeing about harassment. Sorry. Um, over the past year and a half, OCR has issued several policy guidances that touch on both harassment and sexual violence. In October of 2010, we issued a letter addressing bullying and harassment, um, which many of you may have seen. Um, something that we did in the letter that um, we haven't come out 
and stated so clearly in a policy statement before was address harassment of LGBT students. And so when you look at the civil rights laws, um, we, per, we at the federal level, um, we cover race, national origin, color, disability, sex, and age, but sexual orientation is missing from that list. Now, many schools, many states have made up for that and addressed that through their own policies or state laws, but we don't have it at the federal level. But we wanted to make it really clear that the line between sexual orientation discrimination and sex discrimination is a very fuzzy line. And a lot of times when students are being harassed or bullied based on their sexual orientation, there are elements of it that are based on the fact that they're being harassed or bullied for not conforming with gender stereotypes. And that is a violation of Title IX. And this letter made that very clear. And so while you might not be protected by, for being an LGBT student just because of that status, you are protected if you're bullied based on not conforming with gender stereotypes. Um, the administration has also done several other things to, to make schools aware that being inclusive actually helps decrease bullying and harassment. And so one thing that they did was last June issue guidance on schools obligations to provide equal access to all student initiated groups. If you're gonna allow one student initiated group on campus, you have to allow them all. And that includes gay straight alliances. And so Schools have, under Title IX, have an obligation when it comes to harassment. If the harassment is severe, pervasive, or persistent, and it's affecting the student's abilities to participate in school, if the college or the school has knowledge or should have knowledge of the harassment, then they have to take prompt and effective steps to end the harassment, to eliminate the hostile environment, and to work to prevent its reoccurrence. Um, there are a lot of stories out there where this has not happened and it's ended in tragedy. And um, one that many of you may have followed at the time, but I can never get out of my head, is um, is the story of Seth Walt from 2010. Um, <clears throat> Seth Walt went to <clears throat> sorry, a school out in California, <clears throat> and he was, uh, he was 13 years old. And he, um, he was harassed because he had feminine mannerisms. He hung out more with girls than boys. He, um, he didn't conform with what you know boys boys will be boys um, he was physically harassed he was verbally harassed <clears throat> he was grabbed it was really awful he was scared um, his family and he went to administrators repeatedly and the harassment didn't end one day he called his mom he was afraid to leave the school she came picked him up he asked for um, he asked for a piece of paper and some and a pen and went into the backyard she came out about 10 minutes later and they have a tree in their backyard that's a plum tree and she thought he was picking plums until she realized that his, his feet were off the ground and he was hanging from the tree um, and he left a note that you know really described how how he couldn't go back to school and the effects, <coughs> sorry, <laughs> of being in school. Um, his mother reads the suicide note um, and it's on YouTube and it's really quite a, it's quite a moving thing when you're thinking about like how to teach our children that harassment and bullying can't go on in schools. Um, anyways, so uh, we, we went in with the Department of Justice and like I said, found that People knew that this was happening and people weren't taking steps to address it. And we did a lot of work with the school. There's an agreement with the school district um, to, to address this. Um, our remedies, we're working to make them as robust as we can. So while part of the remedies are definitely like 
training staff and 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 training you know or, or providing training and and focus groups and stuff like that for students we're also requiring schools to do climate checks to really check in with the kids with the parents with the teachers to try to figure out if the if what we're putting in place better policies and procedures all of this training is it having an effect is it working because if it's not then we got to figure out something else to do and we're making it really really clear in our agreements now that we got to do that and so it's not about just policies and procedures. It's about, like, how are we really, really going to change the system there? Um, and now I'm going to turn to, uh, to sexual violence, and then I'm going to wrap it up so we can do some question and answers. But, um, but I do want to talk about sexual violence. Um, in this administration, it's the first time that we've affirmatively in a policy document come out and said that sexual violence is covered by Title IX. OCR has always thought that sexual violence was covered by Title IX. This is nothing new. But this is just to make it really, really clear. Sexual violence is sexual harassment. If it's happening on your campus, you can't just delegate this to the police and be done. There could be a hostile environment, and likely is, on your campus when girls and boys are getting raped. And so the guidance is very explicit that, again, that this is sexual harassment. And it talks about the fact that like, even if the police are in there, there are obligations. There are obligations to investigate. There are obligations to work to eradicate the violence. And, and we've, we've done a good amount of work in this area. Um, we've launched a, lot of, a, a good number of compliance reviews recently, and we've gone into a lot of universities where, where we've seen reports of, of such violence. And I'm just going to give you an example of a couple of them. <clears throat> but, but we did go in to the University of Notre Dame when we, when we were seeing reports of a girl who complained about being sexually assaulted, and then she went on to commit suicide. We went into Eastern Michigan yeah, Eastern Michigan University, EMU, um, which I can say that because you all know what EMU is, um, after we learned that a girl had been um, raped and killed in her dorm room. And the university waited 10 weeks to um, admit that something, that there had been any foul play. They had denied it for 10 full weeks until the accused perpetrator was arrested. Um, there was another, there was another university, the um, Notre Dame College, which is in Ohio, where it was a, it's a small college. They had six sexual assaults in the same year some of them by the same exact perpetrator. And arguably, some of these repeat acts were because the original incidents were not properly addressed. In all of these cases, we've gone in with very systemic relief, um, in addition to policies and procedures, and streamlining policies and procedures. Um, you know, As you know how important that is when there's like 10 different policies and procedures out there and you don't know which one to go to or how to do this, <clears throat> things get lost. And these things cannot get lost. Um, the law mandates that they can't. And so really streamlining policies and procedures, making it really clear for, to victims where to go, making sure that they have access when necessary You know, at night. Or, or on call services and checking the climate, really, really checking the climate. Um, and, and no universities are immune from this, and we really, really have to be vigilant about this. Um, we just launched last week with the Department of Justice a compliance review against the University of Montana. Um, the, this is all according to public, what I'm saying is all according to public news reports. Um, in January, a football player was arrested for rape. In March, their star quarterback um, was accused of sexually assaulting somebody, and the temporary restraining order was issued. Um, according to the news articles, shortly thereafter, he was allowed to return to practice. Um, 
According to the news articles, a couple weeks after that, the football coach and the athletic director were both fired from the university. Um, there's been internal investigations showing that there's sexual assaults that are not being properly reported and investigated there. Um, we have to be vigilant. Like we have to make sure that you know what applies to everybody applies to our athletic programs, and so we have to really work on that. Thank you. Um, so I just leave with the fact that a lot has been accomplished, and pe there are people in this room who should be so proud of the accomplishments that they've been part of and how far we've come in the last 40 years. But what's exciting is to see a new generation of people in here who are going to be working to make sure that for the next 40 years, we're pushing and we're making sure that we continue to accomplish these things, because it's you guys that do this. The federal government is just a really small part of this. It's really all of you that make sure that these things happen. Thank you. Do you want Hi, Amy. Thank you for your remarks. I'm Judy Sweet. I'm a former director of athletics and a former senior vice president at the NCA and currently director of the Alliance of Women Coaches. And I appreciate you sharing with us the full scope of Title IX. Sometimes we just get focused on the athletics piece of it. I do have a question, however, about the Butler situation. I was pleased to read on Monday <coughs> that OCR has signed an agreement with Butler in regards to participation. I was surprised to read on Tuesday a headline that indicated that Butler has the responsibility to provide more resources to their men's athletics program. And when I read the article, it appeared that there's a discrepancy in scholarship dollars, that the women are receiving more <coughs> based on their low participation numbers, can you talk about that? Yes. Um, so in, in Butler, we resolved that case without doing a full investigation. Um, Butler came to the table and said, we want to address this. We want to work on this. And so, um, so instead of sort of you know, mandating a particular sport or something like that, which you will see in a college that hopefully we will have an agreement in in the next few weeks. Um, this one, it was allowing them to come up with their plan. Um, and, and in regards to their plan, they have to look not just at the um, athletic, the interests and abilities, but they also do have to look at their financial assistance. And they do have to ensure that their financial assistance um, is substantially proportional to, to their ath athletes. But they sort of go hand in hand because, you know, the goal would be like, as the as the participation rates for women increase, the the financial assistance will be at that level. And so, but the but those but those are two components of it that they do have to look at both. Does that answer your question? Kind of. <laughs> Hi, Amy. My name is Val Bonnet. I worked in OCR headquarters for 15 yes. years. Um, it was and has been my understanding when Fran O'Shea was the national uh, coordinator for Title IX athletics that schools could cite to 1063B of the Title IX regulation uh, regarding affirmative action um, as a justification for awarding women a disproportionately higher amount of scholarship money when women were underrepresented in the program. Um, I know that's not formally written down anywhere, but would that be the direction that OCR would lean? <clears throat> I mean, it's, you're right, it's not written down somewhere. It's, you know, it's a fact-specific inquiry, and so if a university argued the affirmative action prong of it, it would be a fact-specific inquiry to see if that was what they were doing and why they were doing it. Yes. Okay. 
Hi, uh, Nina Chaudhry, National Women's Law Center. Hi, um, just a quick question. A lot of the stats that you cited about compliance reviews and complaints, it, are those available anywhere? Because we get a lot of questions from reporters, and there may be some here as well, who want to know sort of over the years how many compliance reviews and complaints in various areas has OCR done. And there used to be annual reports online, and it's not entirely clear to me that those are still done in the same way. So I just wondered if that was documented somewhere. Yes, <clears throat> um, we're working on an annual report that covers more than one year, because you're right, there isn't an annual report up there right now, and that information will be in it. Um, I'm happy, I'm not, sh I don't think it's like officially posted, but whenever we get a press inquiry, we, we provide the numbers. So, um, so if there are numbers that you want, just let me know. I don't know, hopefully soon. Hi, I'm Arthur Bryant with Public Justice. Hi. Um, from my perspective, the federal government is the sort of big, strong enforcement tool, and there are two pieces that are really critical to making everybody else comply. One is to have some really big example where everybody understands this is the test case or this is the, the lesson for everybody to learn. And I know back when President Clinton was elected, we went with the National Women's Law Center to OCR and said, pick one. There are schools all around the country that are nowhere near compliance, at least in treatment, and giving men far better treatment than women. Pick one, make them a test case, everybody else will get in line. It never happened, it still hasn't happened. And I'm wondering, what do we need to do to make that happen? Uh, or is it just politically impossible? And second and related, the single biggest effect of all that isn't on doing it to one school. It's on everybody else knowing it's happening right. and being educated and scared into complying to the, with law. And so I'm wondering, on all of these compliance reviews that you are doing, how much is done to publicize it so all the rest of the schools know, hey folks, this is what you've got to do so you get in line? No, that's a really good question. Um, this administration um, is you know, from the top down, um, working to be more transparent, right? I mean, and that's a mandate from the White House. And so every time we resolve a compliance review, it's posted on our website. Um, I, I would argue that, like, we've, uh, we've issued more press releases from OCR than, like, you know, any time in the past. That's just my own, you know, sort of. Um, it's, it, it's amazing how much I think we're out there. And maybe people still aren't hearing us. But, um, you know, Nina's on a panel later where, you know, she may talk about the fact that, like, National Women's Law Center is again we're working with OCR to push test cases, and you know, and we're hopeful that that some of those examples will be available in June um, for the anniversary to hopefully have all of you promote what the test cases are because you know I mean I can say like as a federal employee, but like our job is to to do justice and to seek justice, and so we go out and do it and we issue a press release. But there's just so much we're supposed to do about then what to do next with it. And so that is where we turn to all of you to run with it and publicize it and get your statements in. And, and it's, been, it's been really effective. I mean, the sexual violence guidance has gotten a lot, a lot of press, partly because of you know, what people, what other people did. We, we issued the document. Um, some of it hasn't been positive, but most of it has been. <laughs> You know, in negative press, it's press is what people say, right? So. <laughs> well, um, I think we have come to the end of our first session, and Thanks. I would like to thank you, Amy, oh, no, so much for you. being here. <laughs>